Kenier. I'm the CEO of uh, UberCloud. Um, I work with my co-founder, Wolfgang Gensch. Many of you may uh, know him from his high-performance computing days. He's, um, he's the guy who founded the SunGrid engine that uh, was referred to a few times in today's talk. Um, so if you didn't believe that this statement somehow had some truth in it, you probably wouldn't be in this room. So um, to, to innovate new products, to get, gain scientific insight, you need to have access to powerful computers. A, a lot of the scientific experiments have already moved out of the laboratories. They are being done inside of powerful computers. And everything uh, Miha said in his talk are, are correct. And I will refer to it in a, in a few points in my presentation. So <coughs> if computing is so important, what are the tools that we currently have to access the computing power? Currently, there seems to be three ways to do it. Either you do it on a workstation, or you do it on a, a cluster of some sort, or nowadays you can potentially do it in the cloud. So I'll gear a lot of my conversations into the third. Um, when you look at the different ways of doing computing, today, the workstations, the server environments, and the cloud, they each come with their own challenges. So the workstations are slow. OK, the clusters are very complex, <laughs> and they are hard to manage, and they are very expensive. And cloud, guess what? It's a whole new paradigm, and many people don't know how to even approach the problems that it creates, such as you know, security, licensing, data transfers, and whatnot. Uh, however, it comes with some very interesting benefits. So first of all, you can create an HPC system. Now, we can discuss what HPC means till the cows come home, but um, a, a powerful computer. You can access a powerful computer in the cloud at your fingertips, and we will show you a few demos of that today. Um, th these systems are paper use, so they are unlike your workstation that you have to you know, buy every three years. And they are very unlike your um, clusters, which require an army of people to run. Um, and you can scale these systems up and down almost at will. So what we did was we started something that we referred to as HPC experiment back in the day. Now we just call them Ubercloud experiments. And what, what we decided to do was we wanted to learn the challenges, the roadblocks, and the ways around those road roadblocks when it comes to doing high performance computing in the cloud. Let's just say computing in the cloud. Let's get rid of this HP word, which kind of clouds everything up. So <laughs> when, um, when we started the experiments, we started with a very simple design. We said, <coughs> what if we brought an end user, specifically an industry end user? We are not necessarily a scientifically oriented <coughs> Um, community within UberCloud. We are more of an industry-facing uh, community. And what if we brought the end users, the software people, the hardware people, and the experts in, let's say, mechanical engineering, biology, etc. What if we put them all together in one project context and let them work on it? So here we are, two years later, um, 155 experiments have been, have been completed. And I will show you a few of the uh, projects that, that were worked on. We, we put these teams together. We gave them a step-by-step -step process. We helped them along the way so that they could achieve some level of success, whatever, whatever they wanted to do in their project. So what were these projects? I, I threw up a few that, that were done on AWS resources. They go anywhere from you know, heat transfer uh, analysis to, you know, f crunching financial uh, data to, um, you know, simulating antennas. Uh, these are all, uh, th th the point I want to draw here is they are all in different scientific domains. You can, as long as you can find the right people and the right resources, you can make these projects work. And we did many of them in parallel uh, within the context of UberCloud. And they, every single one of them were free. They did not cost the end user anything. Um, here's another uh, bunch. These, are, these were sponsored mostly by Bull Supercomputer. Um, 
So the AWS guys say they are the biggest <laughs> you know, in cloud computing in the world. Well, Bull claims that in Europe. So they are the biggest in Europe. Now that they have been acquired by ATOS, they are even bigger. So th the projects they, that were done on their systems were flash dryer simulations, for example, um, uh, using you know, ANSYS software, um, and uh, many others. So for example, um, the ANSYS guys put this together after a number of their projects. And, and you can see, even within the context of one software application like ANSYS, the projects are very varied. So um, the top one is about, again, drying um, a solid by using um, these jet burners, literally. I mean, these things are the size of about, the diameter is taller than I am. And um, they, they just, they just uh, take tons of solid and get the, um, get the fluid out of them. And they were able to calculate the performance of that machinery inside of a cloud. <coughs> so I will talk about only one team in any sort of detail so that you can get a little bit of a glimpse of what these projects are all about. So uh, Frank Ding, who's, who's a local engineer here, works for Simpson Strong Tie. He brought a project in. And what they, what they do is they build fasteners that you build your home with. I mean, you, you, can, you can literally see how important this is to calculate, you know, when, when will that fastener break? Um, and they, they were using a software tool called Abacus. Um, so Miha was right in one thing. He said engineers want to use their software. So Frank would not move to any other software that you can offer him, even for free, in the cloud. He would want to use Abacus, which is the software he knows how to use. So that's, that's a key takeaway. All of our projects were done with the software tools that the engineers were used to. We cannot yank them away from their tools. Um, so we brought the, um, uh, the, the software player, Abacus. Um, so that's a company called uh, Dissol Systems. Um, they, they joined the experiment. And we used a computing resource <coughs> provider called Nimbix out of, out of Texas. So after putting this team together, they wrote their own use case. They talked about what they wanted to do. And this team together uh, executed that project. Um, here they described what their workflow was. This is an eye chart. You, can, you can't even read it because they are the challenges. I don't want you to read them. Um, so anyway, the, 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 the reality is they ran into, all of our teams ran into very typical problems. It's very hard to get data into the cloud, as you said. Any, any sizable data is very difficult to transport and hard to store. So cloud is no exception. However, they found ways to circumvent that problem. Um, you don't give your users a lot of remote access, as far as I can understand, to visualize their results. These guys needed it, for sure. So they found ways they, they could do that. So every team then turns around and writes a report, which we then publish back to our community. So people can read about what these roadblocks are, what those solutions are. And these are available for download. With, they are completely free. Uh, we published two years in a row. We published um, them inside of a, uh, we call them compendiums. They are a collection of case studies. So if you are interested, doubercloud.com is the place to go where you can download um, dozens of those case studies. So. Um, <laughs> After doing many of these experiments, you start to see patterns. And a lot of the things Miha had on his slides are reaffirmed in our, um, in our case studies. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> there, there's one number I don't agree with. You said there are 12 million scientists. We think it's 20 million plus. I had to disagree with something, yeah, right? You said, said 40 million uh, web pages, right? Right. And I looked at the my, my sources from the test case. Right. Okay. So anyway, 12 million, 20 million. So um, with, with every uh, case study we have done, we started seeing the, the repeated concerns. And that led us to looking at what should be next. 
we said, all right, so if there are so many different ways of doing computing in the cloud, and so many engineers want to do so many different things in the cloud, but how do they find each other? That brought the Uber Cloud Marketplace um, into focus. So we said, okay, that w what if we found a way on the, on the web so that we can bring the engineers who are looking for compute resources and better ways of doing compute in the, on, the, on the cloud with the appropriate providers that are already there. There's the 20 million number we have. So this is what the Uber Cloud Marketplace looks like. We just launched it uh, fairly recently. On the Uber Cloud Marketplace today, you can buy open foam. Any open foam users here? No one? It's a CFD code, relatively popular. OK. All right. <laughs> at, at least some people heard about you know, what open foam might be. And um, we, put, we put open foam on AWS. OK, so well, you can put anything you want on AWS. So why is that even interesting? Well, it becomes interesting because we are able to then move the open foam code around to different cloud providers. Anywhere, anyone, anyone from re, um, Rackspace here? Rackspace? There's a, <laughs> the guy operating the camera. So um, that's, uh, that's pretty cool because we could take the same image and put it on Rackspace today uh, and other provider tomorrow. So full portability is achieved in this specific offer. And on the marketplace, again, we have uh, services such as Autodesk's uh, SIM360. Anyone familiar with that? That's a completely SaaS offer. So they have figured out how to take their software to the cloud, how to register users, how to accept payments by credit card, how to do subscription services. They did all that. But that that's a huge achievement, by the way. And you can use the Autodesk software on the cloud today. We have a number of projects. If you're ever interested in how science could get done on the cloud, you could take a look at one of those projects. We even have a few webinars recorded there on YouTube. So each of these offers have a different flavor to them. And the last one here is just um, you tell us what type of compute power you need, and we'll find it for you. Yes? So th these are made up prices, but I'll tell you what the real prices are. Okay. So uh, you can run open foam for 24 hours on a 32 core machine, which is not high performance computing, but for an engineer, that's usually good enough. Uh, for 24 hours, we charge $199. Absolutely no setup, and it can be activated like that. So I'll, I'll try to show an example, yes. Uh, good question. Vscale is yet another provider. One big difference that this offer here, and I'll show you how this works, is you are, you are not using a portal. You're, you're doing the purchase in a portal, of course. There's a shopping cart here on the web. But that's where the web ends, and you are literally on that 32-core machine. You're not sharing with, a, with anyone. There's no scheduler. You're literally using OpenFoam on a powerful workstation in the cloud. The, it, it's a shame to really call this high-performance computing, but it is a high-performance workstation in the cloud. All right? Otherwise, Yoshi would shoot me, right? <laughs> yes? You talked about it being in a scale, so if you want to say, go to 64, you can just say, I want a bigger instance? Yes. So we haven't enabled that. We, we limit to, to 32 cores, but there's no reason why the technology cannot be used to multiply it. The only reason why we didn't do it is because well, we, we know what Miha said is absolutely true. We do not want a scheduler in that, in that mix. We don't want a SunGrid engine or whatnot. Even though SunGrid engine is great, we, we don't want a scheduler that the user is not very familiar with. These solutions are offered to engineers. They don't need an IT department to use this. All right. Yes. So how does the um, price compare? You know, what did you say the open foam was for? Open foam here, open foam itself is a free no, no, product. No, 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 no. The price you. One hundred ninety-nine dollars for twenty-four hours. So at you know a thousand hours, that's a, a pretty big server you could buy, which is only a fraction of a year. 
Excellent question. So if a user is trying to do compute on either a thousand nodes or if he's going to run a simulation that's going to take forever, he's probably better off by asking for a custom quote. And on the, on the UberCloud marketplace, we have providers who focus on larger jobs. So this is, this is a spectrum. Simple jobs, more complex jobs. Yes? Correct. Correct. On the UberCloud marketplace, we are able to find resource <laughs> providers who will give you the um, software licenses as well, rent them, um, or you can bring your own licenses in, in certain cases. Some people do have their licenses, they just don't have a powerful enough computer. Yes? Excellent question. So if you were to create your own AMI, could you build this service on your own? The answer is yes. However, there are two key points. One, you have to build it yourself. That's hours of engineering time that you could probably spend elsewhere. On the Amazon marketplace, you can always buy AMI by the provider. Yes. So that brings me to my second point. You buy it, you can't take it anywhere. AMIs only work on Amazon. So. This offer here already today runs on multiple uh, resource providers. So you're not locked into Amazon. Yeah, but if I only need 24 hours, what do I say? Oh, sure. So first of all, um, you may find providers who can give you better performance of this software. For example, Amazon is, by the way, a great supporter. So I'm being very careful about what I say. However, Amazon runs on hypervisors. So what if you wanted to take your code to a place where you can run it on bare metal? <coughs> the AMI approach would simply not work. So you're basically investing in a, a technology and kind of locking yourself in if you're using an AMI concept. So what we use here is based on Linux containers, which can be ported from one place to another. We are using Docker, although um, it probably doesn't matter. The container approach is, is the key. We use Docker. Um, other uh, containerization technologies can be used as well. Yes? Are we able to use uh, Amazon's bot instance? Please? Yes, absolutely. Any other questions? All right. Yes? Um, I don't know of marketplaces per se. Um, however, for example, if you go to Ohio Supercomputer Center, you could work with them on multiple different products. Like they, they can also offer you ANSYS or OpenFOAM, etc. However, this is the only one that I know of where many providers on the software side as well as resource side come together. So it creates the one-stop shopping capability for engineers. And I'm being careful not to call scientists. So what, what about the uh, Penguin On Demand? How do you compare those two? Sure. Penguin On Demand would be another supplier and is another supplier of UberCloud. So think of UberCloud as an umbrella on top of Penguin, Rescale, <coughs> Exabyte.io very soon, um, Cluster K very soon. Etc. Yes. I was trying to remember there was something in I think it's called Green Thumb that Microsoft recently purchased. Green Button. Green Button. Thank you. Another provider of Fiber Cloud. Is it the one that has been bought by Microsoft? Yes. Right, right, right. So I wouldn't say they're more of a provider. They're an integrator with applications where it's just to take advantage of the HPC. Yes. And the scientist doesn't know anything about the HPC. Yes. So what Green Button did was they created an SDK, a developer kit which they went and shopped around to different software providers. And they said, look, if you use our SDK, then with the press of one button, the, the job, the heavy job, the computational job that the person is trying to run on his desktop can be ported to the cloud and will manage everything. 
which made it very interesting for Microsoft, and they got snapped up. So again, they are another provider um, that we have on the Uber Cloud experiments. Yes. Excellent question. So let me go one slide back because I knew I was going to confuse everybody. So we are a reseller channel. We are a reseller channel. We are a reseller channel on all these offers. This one we did quite a bit more engineering work on. So we created our own image and we can port it to different providers. Great question. Okay. So here I was going to create some chaos in the room by talking about how you know, Linux containers can be used for high performance computing. Um, but I won't necessarily do that. If um, Timur allows me, I'm just going to plug in my computer and, and show you what we can do. All right. This is completely unscripted. So this is just um, a Linux machine sitting in the cloud somewhere. Make it bigger. Somebody help me. Here we go. So this machine is not a supercomputer, but it has 32 cores. So decent machine. Um, and in many cases, it's good enough for an engineer, as long as he doesn't have to wait on a queue, and he doesn't have to work with a scheduler, and he doesn't have to see scripts, and he doesn't have to do what I just did, which is type on a terminal window, right? Okay, so let's see if we can enable that. So he should not see the screen, right? He should never be here. All right, so now let's, let's give him... Okay, so here I'm just running a very simple script which will launch a container. Within that container, call an image, which I preloaded onto the machine so it doesn't take another minute to download the image. Um, and it will start that image. It will, th this image, when it boots up, is configured so that it creates a brand new user, username and password, email it to the engineer at this address, and um, these are just port numbers. I could have even uh, put defaults for those so you wouldn't even see that, but anyway. Okay, it started. So that's the power of using a container. There's no boot time, you, it just started, and if you don't, if you don't believe me, <coughs> As I said, when, when it boots up, it is configured to send an email. OK, so here the demo gods are not helping me at all. Well, OK, I just wasn't refreshing properly. So my open form server is ready. It sent, me, it sent me an email telling me how to access it. It gave me a password, and it gave me a link to access the server with. So as an engineer, I'm not going to see a single line of Linux, all right? I'm not going to have to download anything on my computer. I, I didn't. I know how to copy-paste, so I'll copy this and paste it into that password area. And ta-da, I know how to use this. I, as, a, as an engineer who is doing work on open foam, this is exactly what you would see on your desktop. Now you're seeing it in the cloud. And we looked at what type of um, server we were running on. So here we have full access to that machine, all, all 32 cores. So I don't I don't have a scheduler. I'm not sharing this machine with anyone else. I didn't do any installation. I don't have to learn Linux. I'm just in my familiar environment having full access to this powerful computer. 
and I can do it literally within seconds. So where does scheduling go, for example, right? The concept of scheduling is completely different in the cloud. Scheduling, as in SGE, for example, has been you have a finite set of resources, right? Even if it's a supercomputer, it has a certain capacity to it. Well, on the cloud, you could go from one cloud to another. You don't have a concept of a capacity. I'm sorry? You have elasticity. You have elasticity. So if server A is busy, I can go to server B. If cloud A is busy, I can go to cloud B. So the concept of scheduling is all about where I run that little script which starts the job. And the engineer then doesn't have to wait on a queue, right? And he doesn't have to share that with anybody. Yes? Can he automate finding other resources? There is so little demand today, no we don't. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer is you could fully automate that entire process. You could, you could know where the resources are. Um, Amazon, for example, publishes its spot pricing. You could look at the prices. You can make comparisons based on where the engineer is versus where the you know, nearest location is from a cloud perspective. You can do all of that very easily. The, the real problem is, can you fix the user experience issue, right? So if I told you today that Amazon is the cheapest resource, go build an open foam uh, service on top of it, it would take you hours even if you knew how to install open foam, right? And with this type of an approach, there's no setup time. So are all your solutions based on, or based on that no VNC type solution? Oh, excellent question. So um, good observation, by the way. So. Um, to make, the, to make the user experience really easy and so that the user didn't have to install anything on his computer, we used a software tool called NoVNC. NoVNC basically um, connects to the desktop of, this, of the server through a VNC uh, client and you can just see it all in your browser. So to answer your question, uh, currently, yes, our solutions are built on NoVNC. However, no VNC gives you, just like all VNC solutions, it gives you very limited capabilities in terms of screen sharing. So it looks okay here, but if there was a 3D model on the screen with sophisticated, let's say, flows and animations, you would start to ask for more, right? So um, what we're doing there is, um, we, since we have the capability to create these images, our, one of our next partners gives us the capabilities to do 3D HD graphics with GPU support. So tear out, no VNC, put in 3D graphics on HD if the user wants to pay for that. So there's no reason why you couldn't create different offers, one with HD, one with no VNC, and let the user pick. I, I, I think that's exactly where this market is going to go. Yes. So for that, why not just do something like X embed X nesting in the browser? Um, good question. I don't know the answer to that. Can somebody help? So VNC is a patch-based system. Um, instead, you can use it to deal with the basically 3D rendering, all right. the stuff, all the stuff that kind of gets filtered out right. by motion compression and everything else. Right. Just talk X. Um, X. X server. Yeah. X windows, I see. And you have X make. So, so the thing is, what you can do is use an X server uh -huh. approach. Uh -huh. X nest is basically a headless X server. Okay. Um, the work to be done would be to take that building it into a, you know into like a web page sure. for your viewer, rather than, you know kind of like you're using the Java probably right. the Java communication for the VNC. Right. So doing something like that actually yeah, yeah. probably I'm sure there will be a dozen different mechanisms oh, at the end of the day. Well, uh, uh, that, I'm not sure how that helps you as far as 3D acceleration and GPU. You, VNC is designed to get rid of a lot of stuff to, get, to give you the performance for the typical type of stuff. I'm done. And they've done quite a bit of work at attack on that, so like they're uh, remote business solution is to run, so you run, you know, 
essentially virtual frame buffer that GNC runs on and use GPUs for you to get the GPU backing, but all you have to send over the wire, you know, the, the front of right. the image essentially. Right. And what and I was so suggesting is by using the different right. the underlying DMC, right. X windows, you can actually get those things rather than have GNC built in now. So by the way, that has been done by no machine. By no, no machine? No machine. Yep. So you need to keep in mind portability. You need to keep in mind things like um, can I put in different software applications if needed, so on and so forth. And each of the solutions, like no VNC versus X Windows, will have its own. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We are working with another provider who came exactly from that world. Um, the the big difference there is with um, with a few providers who came from the computer aided engineering world, they they are able to understand 3D graphics a lot better than the gaming companies. Gaming companies are great in giving you HD graphics, but they don't really understand the, the 3D nature of it. So when you're trying to manipulate, like move things around, etc., um, the there are some advantages to using the CAD company's well, solutions. The issue that we've had with stuff we've been doing is, uh, or that I would see that's different from gaming. In gaming, you're kind of concerned with the big picture, you know, with engineering. At least most people are concerned with you know, the low-level right. fidelity. Right. Thing. So it's a little different. Yeah. There are similarities. But but I think they will find a way into the marketplace too, because they they have very different price points. For example. And then Nvidia actually offers a solution where they do all the rendering in their cloud. Yes. And then ship you the yes. Yes. Kim. So it's very easy to start a server, right? And the engineer right. can start working right away. Yes. But I wish he didn't unplug it. I, I would show you. <laughs> okay, so one of the things we have done is we said, all right, so if this is a cloud service, why not plug in your S3 buckets or your um, Dropbox files? So if you stop right after the presentation, I can show you how those connectors work. You can literally pull your files from the cloud. Yeah. All right, I better we step away. Thank you. Thanks so much.